Welcome to Beating Cancer Daily. Beating stage four cancer for 30 years still takes my breath away every time I say it. I'm Saren, founder of the Comedy Cures Foundation, and I hope you'll join me for just a few minutes daily for the next 365 days so we may laugh, learn, maybe cry a little as we live our best days beating cancer daily together. It is such a pleasure to have this reoccurring guest week after week. And I know you know who it is, Missy Hall, comedian Missy Hall, because Missy is not only a cancer patient, but now a cancer patient survivor and comedian. And Missy gives us blessing to come on to Beating Cancer Daily every week and share not only her journey with us, but her comic perspective. And I'm just so happy to have you back, Missy. I need a little bit of Missy. Oh, my goodness. I am always so happy for this time with you. I really love it. I look forward to it. It's one of my favorite things. I know. I missed you so much. I can't wait. We even checked in with each other midweek because we're just so used to talking to each other now that we just checked in to see how we were doing. And Missy, you shared something so personal as you usually do. And I want you to explain uh, what's going on. Okay. It was the strangest thing. You know, I am a probably about six months into survivorship now. Wait, wait, can we just honor that for a yeah, second? Yes. You know what? Let because me let that feel like something for a minute. That is something to be able to go through all the treatment and surgery that you went through and to be able to say, I'm six months into survivorship. I just remember when I didn't get that moment, no matter what they did, Three surgeries, 44 radiation treatments, two and a half years of chemo, and nothing was working. And I didn't get that blessing to say those words until so much later. So just what does that feel like? It feels so surreal in so far as I keep looking at it in terms of this was all just starting for me last year. So now that I'm in survivorship, there's almost this, wait, what, what happened? Like I, my brain hasn't caught up because I had a mammogram in January, a diagnosis in February, then began treatment in immediately. And now it's done. So it was boom, 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 which I'm so grateful for. Yours was spread out over so much time. Yeah, but yours just for timing, because people are going to listen to this for years. So that was of a prior year. And now we're in the new calendar year. Exactly. Exactly. We are pretty much one year now from my diagnosis and I'm in survivorship. And what I have learned is that as I've gone, through this process. I've done all the things, right? I, I'm a spiritual person. I'm a meditator. I'm in therapy. I'm doing all the physical work. The trifecta. The yeah. trifecta of <laughs> cancer treatment. I bet if I took a poll, so many people would just say, oh, I did the same thing. I yes, did the we, same thing. <laughs> you know how people have those t-shirts for running a marathon? Yeah. Or I'm sorry, the triathlon. We need triathlon t-shirts. But <laughs> and it's so true. Because you take all the, like my oncologist was like, I couldn't even tell you to do anything different. I'm doing all the things. and But you're also performing as a comedian and you never stopped performing through all of this, which is so mind boggling. Yeah, it's strange. It's so strange when I think, I'm like, I'm not sure exactly how I did all of that at this same. Yeah, but we have comedy material to prove it. Yes, we do. We absolutely do. Now you have a whole subject matter that you can talk about that you definitely knew nothing about a year ago. Exactly. It's a whole new chapter. It's a whole before and after. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it uh, gives BC 
Yes. A whole new meaning, right? <laughs> it, it, it really does. Before cancer, after cancer. It absolutely does. And anybody, even if you just love somebody that's gone through this and live with somebody, you know, your life changes. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So um, I just, I, I'm sorry I interrupted you, but okay. anytime someone says about survivorship or getting a clean scan, in my head, I hear angels singing and music. I hear, ah, like I just hear that. Yes. And do you, it's funny that you say that because when I was at the mammogram and found everything was fine, I got in the car and I was just looking around and I was like, now I just drive home. You know what I mean? Like now what? Now what? Angels just sang. You mean yeah. <laughs> angels just sang, I got a standing ovation for yes. getting through survivorship. And now I go home in my car alone. We need a party. Like, I got to what scoop up the dog poop in the backyard. <laughs> like I feel, I feel like I just won an Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> I am a thriver now. I am a champion. No, no, it's, it's so crazy. I, cause that gratification was just told that I would never be able to say those words. I mean, they wouldn't even say that I had no evidence of disease or then that I wasn't, that I was in remission. They would not use those words medically. So that survivor word was just so delayed for me. But anytime someone says it, including you, I feel like I'm reliving it. And I am so empathetic about what you had to go through to get to that word. And look, I was just living symbiotically with my cancer. They were just like, this is just a thing. You're just living with cancer. And that's a whole nother path. And that's a whole nother thing to celebrate. And that's a whole nother episode. Like how do you sure. thrive even though you have active cancer? So that's what this podcast is about. 365 days of how do you improve the quality of your life and thrive no matter where you are in that continuum? Are you just diagnosed? Are you in treatment? Are you living with cancer? Are you a survivor? I don't know. I just, we got off on this tangent, but I love it. Yes. But I, I want to honor what went on for you this week because I think we've all been there. And if you haven't been there, hopefully we'll give you some strategies on how both Missy and I have gone through this very strong moment in a cancer journey. Yeah, really, I was blindsided in my own mind. It was late at night and I've had trouble sleeping, some of the side effects of my medication and things. So I was just reading an essay online from a friend of mine, and it was about a dear friend of hers who had early stage cancer, and then that was the topic sentence, and then three sentences in, she had a recurrence, and she met, talked about her treatment and things, and I had to put the computer down. I was reading it on my computer, and Saren, my... I've heard the expression before, my blood ran cold. That's what I felt like. And suddenly I had a physical react, like my heart started racing and I felt like someone was sitting on my chest. It sounds like a classic panic attack. Yes. And that's not usually how I respond to fear. Usually I shut down. I am kind of a curl in a ball, kind of shut down this my whole body was highly activated. Yeah, it sounds like you had a complete visceral reaction to reading I, that. I really did. And then I started applying it to myself. And I'm like, what if all I'm doing doesn't matter? Like, it doesn't matter. It's going to come back. And I really just spiraled. I and can see the tears in your yeah. eyes right now and oh. the way your face has gotten so serious. We're actually looking at each other on video right now. And it is not the way that you normally carry your face. Yeah. So I can see now this is even triggering something for you. Yeah, it's it made me realize how right on the edge of despair and panic I am still. 
you're so fresh out of this, yes. Missy. I mean, you just had that scam a moment ago. Yes. And that is, that's a big relief, but you probably still have not processed what you just went through. I think you're right. I think, and this might apply to so many people, I think I was so busy doing it right. You know what 100%. I mean? hundred percent. Handling it like a champ, following directions, trying to just be really good at doing it. <laughs> and know? also being so brave because everybody yes. else around you is falling apart. We have episodes that yeah. we've done specifically like on Cancer Brave. Oh, it's a yeah. pressure that a lot of patients feel like. I have to stay strong so nobody else falls apart. I've seen people be warriors. I better be a warrior too. I mean, mm -hmm. there are so many times we discuss different features of this on Beating Cancer Daily. And what I respected so much was that you sent me an SOS text. Like yes. you didn't think you had to do this alone. And that's what I want to share is that if you are feeling a panic attack or an anxiety attack or very lonely or very depressed, you don't have to do this alone. You can reach out to a fellow patient, a survivor, the nurse in your doctor's office, a therapist within your uh, hospital, social worker. Plus there's so many hotlines that you can call and you don't have to be suicidal to call a suicide hotline. If you're feeling distress we don't want you to get to that level of distress. We hope that we can help before something gets so painful and so dramatic. So I really respected that you reached out to me. And if you remember, I just was, Missy, this is totally normal Yes, that you're going through this. This is like an aftershock of an earthquake. <laughs> yes. Oh, what a perfect analogy. And it settled me immediately. And here's something I want to bring up. My husband was in bed next to me while this was happening. And I'm going to say this as a joke, but I think you'll get it. I'm like, but he is of no use, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because he's just a, but you're fine. Everything's okay. It's fine, which is great. I don't. I would never want him to understand. I don't want him to have the wherewithal to understand. But sometimes having somebody next to you that doesn't know how to empathetically respond, because it's not fine. Your exactly. emotions and your feelings and your panic are real and it's yeah. not fine. But Sometimes partners don't know how to do any better, but exactly. what I was going to say is that sometimes that response can make you feel even lonelier. Exactly. It's the shutdown. He's to him. It's over. And to me, it's not over, but I also don't want, you can't dump that on somebody at two o'clock in the morning and knowing, and my brain was like, I, you know what? I'm going to text Saren because she'll get it. And even just having you say that's so normal felt good. Right now, the aftershocks analogy, boom, that lives in my brain now. The next time I get this feeling, the feeling is real, right? 100%. We get and the visceral yeah. reactions, the sweating, the heart pounding, the neck tension, wanting to throw up, stomach pains. I mean, not being able to sleep. I mean, those are just classic post-traumatic stress. I mean, this yes. journey is and can be so stressful. And you were superwoman, girl. I mean, we've talked about the fact that you not only got up on stage minutes after your surgery, but you're a physical comedian and you had to navigate the physical aspect of stitches. I mean, I know I ripped my stitches. Yes. I was also doing the crazy stuff, performing yep. like you were too with surgery, but it's not normal. I'm just letting you know the part's <laughs> not normal. We are not normal in going back <laughs> and performing 
with all this treatment. Yeah. <laughs> the panic attack is normal. Post traumatic stress is normal, but yes. <laughs> the two of us are a little mashugana. Mashugana means crazy. I like mashugana. I will accept that. <laughs> I have a friend who doesn't know any Yiddish and she's Michigan. The Michigan. <laughs> Oh no, that's going to get tangled. I know. It's so funny. Oh, I was love cracking it. me up. But back to that moment. I'm sorry that you had it, but as we corresponded, yes. And Missy and I just felt it was really important that we share this real time now that we could get on Zoom together, that we share this with you because you may have experience this. And if you haven't, hopefully you won't. But if it happens, you'll be able to remember this episode and hopefully go back and listen to it or share it with somebody that's having a panic attack or a series of panic attacks. So I want to hear how you did it, Missy, and then we can talk about some strategies that I have done. Okay. The first thing that I did was try to wake myself all the way up and look around the room. The mindfulness technique of going, okay, what's something I see? What's something I feel? And then thinking to myself, what is my body doing? So I tried that. I tried some breathing techniques and it this one didn't respond. And I'm used to those things being very helpful. Like I did that during my biopsy and all of that and sailed through this. Couldn't calm me down. That's amazing because those are some of the techniques that we teach on an episode about cancer anxiety. So I'm glad that you knew them and that you could try to quiet and calm down. Yes. I did. And then I just, I kept spiraling. So my doctor at the beginning of my, just the whole journey wrote me a prescription for 10 Xanax and I had seven left. So (laughs) I I took one. I didn't, I took one. Mm -hmm. And let's explain what Xanax is because somebody might not know. And you might want to ask your medical professional if that would be a good idea for you and what form would be a good idea for you of an anti-anxiety medicine. So let's explain, what do you use it for? Okay. I use, and it's a very small mill. I can't even remember how tiny the tablets are, but just a small dose when I first was getting my diagnosis and was walking around in a state of nerves. I would take one half of a pill, which is a tiny, a tiny bit to, I almost, for me, it kind of pushed the adrenaline away and just helped me function a little bit better. What I would also like to say is if I had a half of an anxiety pill when I was feeling fine, I'd fall asleep. Like it's not a, it's not a casual thing, like an antidepressant that you take. It is an as needed thing. And my doctor recommended it for me for the feelings of, I described it before this panic attack. I described it as just constant butterflies in my stomach. That's really beautiful way to describe something that can be just so nerve wracking. What I love is that you are just so honest about, you know, how this impacts you. I can also say that some people will try chamomile tea to quiet them. Some people will try to get a massage. They have a partner that's nearby. Some people, a massage would make very anxious when they're in that state of nerves. But, you know, whatever it is that you're going through, someone said to me once, and I've mentioned this before on episodes, they said to me, would you send your child out in a rainstorm without a raincoat, galoshes, and an umbrella? You would never do that. So take this idea of weather and apply it to an internal emotional rainstorm. You sometimes need a bit of galoshes, a 
an umbrella and a raincoat. And that's what an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety pill could be. And I'm not a big medicine taker, but when they said to me, why are you doing this to yourself? You wouldn't do that to a child in the rain. So why don't you treat yourself the same way? And from that day forward, I got off my high horse about medicine. And I just said, you know what? If that ever comes up for me again, I will not put a block up. I will be open to that idea. And I'm so proud of you that you really did what you needed to do for yourself. I did. And I, and again, I like to share it because I know so many people I told, (laughs) I just came up with this arbitrary number. I said to my surgeon, I was like, I never want to have more than four prescriptions at any given time my whole life. Right. So if I've got to take the anestrozole and if I'm on it, I was like, I just don't want to be anybody with a long list of prescriptions. But and I did I do all of the other stuff. But my doctor, when she prescribed the Xanax, she's like, you will you might find that just knowing these are in your medicine cabinet is enough. Wow, that's so insightful. And I just want to say, we don't have Xanax manufacturers as a sponsor. This is just real time. But I bet after they hear this episode, they're going to be like, could we sponsor your podcast? (laughs) And I'm going to say, no, I'm not. I'm not doing any sponsorship. I like just to have these conversations and And that this podcast is donor supported. People make donations to the Comedy Cures Foundation so that we don't have to rely on commercials or sponsors. I'm not sure that can always be, but that's been my heart from the beginning is that our conversations are just too intimate to to get money from sponsors. If you haven't made a donation to support the podcast and you can, please go to comedycures.org and make a donation. Yes. <laughs> Don't have to take but, Xanax as a sponsor. Be good. <laughs> no, but, and I do want to bring up because this surprised me when I was in the thick of it, I didn't need to use that medication because I was doing all of the other things I was in treatment that time, even after my surgery, I didn't need extra pain medicine or anything like that. So I will be happy to admit that I was so surprised that it was six months after treatment was over that I suddenly was like, oh my gosh, I need this. And it surprised me so much. I just wanted to share it because... There's got to be somebody hearing this. Yeah. I love this visual. I'm such a visual person. And I thought of it as, okay, you were blindsided. Like when you watch a football player and they go up to catch and they don't realize that there's a defender nearby and they just bang. They yes. wallop you from the side. That's what I, that's what it feels like to me. That moment was, and I have this technique that when I realize that I'm holding on to something like some anger or anxiety or some kind of palpitation like you were describing, I do all the things you were saying. And then I also just stop and I go, okay, if this weren't my life, is there anything funny about what I'm feeling or thinking right now. So if this weren't me and I were told and I was told about the situation, is there anything funny that I'm feeling, seeing, experiencing, hearing that I can now start thinking comedically about and hijack my brain and go yep. to my happy place, which is my comic perspective and thinking something funny. So now that you're out of that momentary panic attack, can you look back on that situation and think how we would comedically write a panic attack set? Oh, absolutely. Because one of the things, and is my husband's response 
I thought you were going to go there. Yeah, when I, when it, you said it, I was like, oh my gosh, wait till I tell Missy that my impression is that's comedy gold. Totally useless for yeah, a wife completely. having a panic attack. Yeah, like completely useless. It was so useless. And it is so funny because when you think of comedy, like you could do an analogy, like he he would have probably been just as useless had an intruder come in the house and I woke him up in the middle of the night. I don't know where. No, I see it. I see it. And I just want to explain to you that now I'm looking at Missy's face. And the minute I said, let's think comedically about it, because that's a technique that I use when I feel anything abnormal happening in my body, that's not a warning sign. Okay, someone's going to attack you. You have to get away. I mean, I'm just talking about something as personal as being in your bed and having a panic attack. The minute I said it to her, her entire face lit up, her eyes started sparkling. She started laughing and you could see her comedy writer brain going 90 miles per hour, trying to just like, if you've ever driven a stick shift, it mm-hmm. was like trying to find the moment where the clutch and the gas and then the handle shifting the gears all got traction. Yes. I mean, I'm thinking I was like, oh, you telling me everything's fine. That's perfect. You know what? I'll just write that on an index card and tape it to your back. So when I wake up, <laughs> I won't even have to ask you next time. You've just got it because that <laughs> fixed everything. I think there's also a way to go with the symptoms, like the actual visceral symptoms that happen. I think that could be funny. It's interesting because if you've heard other episodes, sometimes Missy and I spontaneously just stop and we try to examine something from a 360 perspective. And then What could we link it to? Because that's what you really do when you write comedy and the exaggeration piece. So I think that's actually, Missy, it was so visceral that you could actually exaggerate it and it could even be funnier. Oh, my God. It's true. Like, I could literally see my heart in my throat, like coming out like a cartoon. Yeah, and, oh, that's funny. Yeah, that's a visual. Yeah. That's funny. Though. Yeah, that kind of a visual. Talk about your stomach and talk about the fact also I would have a hot flash in the middle of it and have to pee. Every organ <laughs> cannot do this all at the same time. <laughs> the I, only <laughs> organ not working clearly is my actual brain, which is what I need to have in this situation. I was actually thinking like my heart was beating so fast that and then just upping that. Oh, absolutely. My husband was so useless that (laughs) like that, that, those are some funny ways to go. Exactly. It, my husband was so useless. It, yeah. I mean, it reminds me of why I have to send him to the store with pictures of food rather than a grocery list. <laughs> <laughs> so now you can see, even if you're not a comedy writer or a comedian, you could see how this could give you that life preserver, that little like life preserver in the sea when you're drowning in a panic attack that you could kind of latch on to and pull yourself out of it. I do all the techniques that you said, Missy, like becoming very concrete. I actually would, if I were standing, feel my feet planted in my shoes and my shoes on the ground. But if I'm in the bed, then I feel the weight of my body at each point, my heels touching, you know how your heels yes, hit the yes. bed, the back of your head has a pressure point, your sits bones, like the back of your butt yes. has pressure points. So I would probably also go through the whole body if I were laying in bed, but this is just a fun technique and you're so good at thinking comedically that might work for you at, with the breathing. Like I would right. breathing is key. Yeah, it, it is. And the breathing, the, I keep reading so much about how much our breath and going back to our breath can do it. And then that's also funny. I mean, you could actually write. That's what I was going to say. 
The nice thing too is when you shift to the comedic perspective, I'm trying to relax. I'm thinking about my heels on the mattress and remembering that I should call someone about my bunion. I I actually went there mentally the minute you started it. I was like, oh, she's going to go for the bunion because bunion's a funny word. Exactly. Bunion is a funny word. Yeah. And we've done episodes, I think, on comic perspective and funny words. Yeah. Yeah, That's good. That's good. Yeah. And it's just all of these. And it does. And then even if what is coming out of my mouth right now is not comedy gold, this is how comedy starts, right? You just start spouting stuff and then you think about it and polish it. And but it- you're, you're planting these seeds. Like we're sitting here, yeah. think of a garden. We're putting these seeds in. Then Missy's going to go back and water her garden. And, yes. and then boom, what's going to sprout our funny comedy bits and maybe some weeds. Everything right. doesn't come out, as you said, as comedy gold. But it shifts everything. Like even just talking, my energy is different. Everything feels different. And it is so helpful. I'm so proud of you. I know that you have to go perform. You're doing a comedy show very shortly. And mm-hmm. so I don't want to keep you, but I just want to say I am always with you. And I'm always with every listener of this podcast. You are never, ever alone. We all share this experience. And I love you, girl. I love you too. And thank you for always showing up for me. That's just so special. And I really appreciate it. And you always show up for me too. And that's what a chemo buddy is, or even if you don't have chemo, we call it like a chemo buddy. You find somebody hopefully in your journey that can just have your back in this thing where you don't have to describe it because somebody doesn't understand it. You kind of speak in a shorthand, right? Yes. I've even found that with audience members after shows. Yeah. We'll just talk in estrogen positive, (laughs) H-E-R. I mean, it's just... (laughs) And then fist bump and walk away. There's beauty in that. There really is. Yeah. Yeah. There, And it doesn't matter if you're male, female, you could call it a sisterhood, brotherhood. It just happens in this interesting way. It's a look, it's a nod, it's a hug. Pretty special. And I'm so glad that you're one of mine. Uh, right back at you. I'm. Mean, it's really special for me. If you want to connect with Missy and learn more, you can go to Missy Hall on all social media. She actually does a Tuesday night date night live on Facebook with her husband, Mr. Fine, (laughs) 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 Jeremy, and he's a comedian also. So it's fun to hear two comedians kind of, you know, just have life and a date and be funny. So If you can't find Missy Hall, you can go to comedycures.org. That's my charity website. You can hit the contact button and email me if you have thoughts, if you want to share anything about your panic attacks or get more information. You want to just write to me anything you can. And if you want to contact Missy that way, I'll pass it on to her. If you want to record your thoughts and not sit there and write a message, you just want to talk like we do on this podcast, you can go to the podcast section and hit record. And I get all your messages and I love them. We appreciate them. And you're why this podcast is so special. So have a blessed day and I'll see you tomorrow. If you love today's episode, then tell the world. Why? Because Beating Cancer Daily and our membership circle are both a listener and donor supported experience. So the more people you tell and the more people that join us, the more robust and interesting programs our nonprofit, the Comedy Cures Foundation, can bring to you throughout the year. I really want you to go to ComedyCures.org. And of course, I always want you to make a donation. It's tax deductible to the extent allowed by law. But what's super exciting is not only can you laugh and explore the comedy there, you can look at our membership levels and find the one that's great for you. And if you're feeling a little bit generous, gift one to a chemo brother or sister or to a caregiver that you just want to help them improve the quality of their day. 
Thanks so much. See you tomorrow. Guess what time it is? It's time for me to read the disclaimer. Beating Cancer Daily and the Membership Circle are not in lieu of medical advice or treatment. They are for entertainment purposes only. Please consult your healthcare team to review your best strategy. Thanks for listening.